Something happens the moment you become a father. You become a little more lame. And you, uh, you start to see yourself do things that you swore you'd never do. Sayings that you would cringe at as a child and just shake your head and say, I'm never going to be that lame, soon come out of your mouth. And you just automatically start to develop a new set of rules. For instance, rule number one, no one under the age of 18 is to touch the thermostat at any point in time, no matter what. Don't touch it. If you leave a room, turn off the lights. It isn't rocket science. We don't need to leave the lights on for a room. Nobody's in. If you're driving and the fighting starts, it doesn't matter who started it. You're just going to put an end to it. And if that, doesn't, if that doesn't work, the first time you mention it, the second time the radio's going off, the voice is getting raised, and you are this close to pulling over to the side of the road and so help you. So help you, if that doesn't get through, you will pull over to the side of the road just to make your point. You are never asleep on the couch. You're either praying or resting your eyes. These are just some of the rules. Yeah, see? Yeah, exactly. And for those of you who question this, you're just not as spiritual as us, all right? We're deep in prayer. Snoring is our prayer language. You don't get to ask, all right? These are just some of the rules that you automatically get as a dad. Now, there is, there's, a very, there's a very fine zone that you can get in at night after, after the kids are in bed and everybody else in, in the house has, has gone to bed and you're down relaxing. You want to get into the place where you're really relaxed, but you're not too relaxed. Because if you get too relaxed, then what happens is when you have to walk upstairs or walk down the hall to get into bed, then you find yourself exerting energy and that snaps you out of it. And then you got to work yourself back down. No, you want to be in just the right space where as soon as you crawl into bed, your head hits the pillow. There's a smile on your face and you're hidden into dreamland. And I was there one night. I was there. I hadn't fallen asleep on the couch, but I was perfectly relaxed. Like, I, I felt like I could lead a yoga class at the time. I mean, I was just, I was zen. As I took each step, I would just say namaste. And I, I made it into the room. And it was just that night, I knew as soon as the head hit the pillow, I was going to be out and it was going to be great. And my wife, she has a different nightly routine. She loves to fall asleep to the drama of the Gilmore Girls. Apparently, there's not enough drama in the real world for her. And so she wants, to, she wants to relive the drama of the Gilmore Girls nightly on Netflix. And whatever, I go to bed after her, so that's fine. She can fall asleep to the Gilmore Girls. But as I climbed into bed, I reached down. And it wasn't there. And all of a sudden, the perfect night's sleep that I was so looking forward to was dashed because I couldn't find the stupid television remote to turn off the TV. And as much as my wife can fall asleep to the drama of the Gilmore Girls, I cannot. And so I started to wrestle around a little bit. And I couldn't find the remote. I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I'm going all around. And now the room is dark, so I have a choice to make. Do I flip on the light to find the remote? And every person who's married will tell you, no, you do not flip on the light after your wife is asleep unless you really, really, really want to fight. And so I'm like, all right, I'm not going to do that. But I am looking everywhere. I'm feeling I can't find it. I've got the flashlight going on my phone. I can't find it. I'm trying to make sure that the light from the flashlight doesn't shine into Brooklyn's eyes. I can't find it. And then I've got a choice to make. Do I gently wake her up? Which doesn't exist. Because I, I'm a light sleeper. And so if, if my wife ever needs something from me, even in the midst of my slumber, she can just gently tap me on the arm. And I will awake with a smile on my face. <laughs> it's true. 
And I will say, yes, love of my life, how can I help you? <laughs> but Brooke is not a light sleeper. And so, I mean, you've got to shake her violently in order just to wake her up. And then you're taking your life into your own hands at that point in time. Because uh, she's angry, all right? So pray for me. She's angry. But, but I, I couldn't find the remote. So then I decided I'm just going to unplug the TV. Well, the problem is the TV was on a power strip behind a piece of furniture, and I tried to move the furniture, and again, I was kind of tired, and it just wasn't budging. Nothing. Nothing. Like, at this point, she just has to be faking. You have to be awake at this point. Nothing. So I put my face like two inches from hers. And I grab her shoulder. And I'm like, Brooke. And she shoots up. And she's like, what, what, what do you want? And I'm like, where's the TV remote? She's like, what? I'm like, I, I need the TV remote. She's like, it's right over there by your pillow. And I'm like, no. right next to the pillow. And then she said, I can't believe you'd wake me up and threw herself down on the bed with the force of Randy Macho Man Savage coming off the top rope with the elbow drop in the 1980s and the WWF. I mean, that bed just shook. I swear, I, I can't verify this, but I swear the remote bounced up in the air a little bit and bounced right back down. She's like, why would you wake me up for the remote? Why wouldn't you just turn off the TV with the button on the TV? <laughs> Which, in hindsight, is a fair question. <laughs> I didn't know where it was. I couldn't find it. I can't believe you'd wake me up. Now, if you've ever been there and you've ever been woken out of a dead sleep, especially for something that you thought was rather small, chances are your response wasn't as loving as mine would be if somebody woke me up out of a dead sleep. And I just responded, yes, dear, however can I serve you? That's probably not how I would respond either. And Jesus uses this to teach us something about prayer that we're going to look at today. So if you have your phones or your tablets, go ahead and go to the Bible app, and you can follow along as we're going we're gonna to pick up the story in Luke 11, in verse 5, and you can follow along there. And if you don't have the Bible app yet on your phones or your tablets, you can follow along on your screens as we learn something else that Jesus has to teach us about prayer. But before we dive into Luke 11, I just want to remind you of what we've already seen regarding prayer. We've already seen that... There is value in being persistent. There's value in being persistent in prayer. There's value in being persistent in all of life. But Jesus uses the analogy of a widow going before a corrupt judge who doesn't care about anyone but himself. But just because of her persistence, the judge will hear her case. And Jesus draws the conclusion, how much more with a God who loves and cares about us should we go before him in prayer? So there is value in prayer persistence. And then we saw how not to pray. We saw that God doesn't need a special vocabulary. God isn't impressed with us trying to, trying to work in some system of religiosity into the way that we pray. He just wants us to communicate with him. He just values open and honest communication with us. And then last week we saw, using the Lord's Prayer, how we should pray. And not that the Lord's Prayer is a manuscript, but rather it's a method that Jesus utilized to teach us the proper way that we should pray. And so today, on the heels of Jesus reciting the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, we're going to see another teaching that Jesus has for us regarding the idea of prayer. And this morning, we're going to see the goodness of God. We're going to see the goodness of God and his response to his children, his response to us when we pray. So I'm really excited for this journey this morning. Luke eleven five, 5, we read these words. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves? For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. 
So Jesus is, is using this analogy with those who have just listened to him talk about the Lord's Prayer. And he says, which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. Now, lend me three loaves is the equivalent of us going over to somebody's house in the middle of the night and saying, hey, can I borrow a cup of sugar? All right. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a small, it's a small ask, but it's, it's midnight and it's inconvenient. And understand, especially in the region that Jesus was speaking, people would travel often later into the evening because of the heat of the day. And obviously there weren't cars at the time and air conditioning and everything else. And so just some brutal daytime temperatures. And so journeys would happen later in the afternoon into early evening as the sun was setting and the heat wasn't as oppressive. And so he's using this analogy that somebody arrives really late to somebody's home and the host is faced with a choice. The choice that they're faced with is this. Do I be a bad neighbor? and not go over and wake up my neighbor, or do I be a bad host? And provide to people after a trip absolutely nothing for them to eat. So that's the choice that the neighbor and this, that the host, excuse me, in this analogy that Jesus is using is faced with. The choice of do I want to be a bad neighbor, do I not want to na- wake up my neighbor, or do I want to be a bad host? And in that society in particular, there was great societal importance on being a generous host. And so the neighbor in this analogy in the story that Jesus uses wakes up in the middle of the night and goes to their neighbor and asks to borrow three loaves of bread. And Jesus continues, and he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. It's late. It's the middle of the night. We're asleep. Go away. Is that the response? I mean, every parent has been there. Every parent's been there. When the kid is just crying all day long, and then you're like, oh, they'll wear themselves out. No, no, they don't. (laughs) And then they're crying all night long, and the swing doesn't work, and the bouncy game doesn't work, and the rockabye baby for the 87th time doesn't work, and everything just, it, it just doesn't work. And then you're like, forget it. I'm going driving. And it works. And you're like, all right, I'm going to keep driving for a little bit. I'm going to get really out. And they're out. Then you pray. You turn off the car. And their eyes are still asleep. You go and you un- unfasten the car seat. You don't even bother with the handle because of the stupid clicking noise it could make. It could ruin everything. So you pick up the car seat. You tiptoe to the door. And you turn the handle. You open the door. And you gently carry the car seat over by the crib. And you set it down. You're like, forget this. They're sleeping in the car seat tonight. One night ain't going to kill him. Like by the second child, you don't even put them in their room, right? You just drop them off right where you enter the house. And you're like, see you in the morning. By the first kid, you, you carry them into the room. Oh, by the third kid, they're just sleeping in the car. But all right, you just you drop them off. It's quiet. You lay down. You're exhausted. They're finally asleep. I need a loaf of bread. Go away. The kids are asleep. It's late. What, is this how he'd answer? Midnight? Jesus continues. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. 
Jesus says this isn't an act of friendship, but just because of his shameless nature. The fact that he's coming over in the middle of the night and knocking on the door. This is the equivalent of renting a mariachi band to let somebody know that you love them, all right? This is just shameless, and it's all out there. And Jesus says just based on that alone, based on the shameless nature of this request, he will get up. And he'll give him whatever he needs. And then Jesus ties in this analogy with us in prayer. And he says this, and I tell you, and I tell you, this is what you need to learn. This is your takeaway. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Let me read this again. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Now notice as the list goes on, it gets more intense in a way. You ask, that's, that's simple. Asking is a request. It's a request. You make a request. There's a need. You make a request. That's, an, that's the ask. It's, it's amazing that, that sometimes in life that, that we have everything available to us that we need, but whether it's for pride or, or whatever the case may be, we don't have access to it merely because we lack an ask. Merely because we don't ask. And that's true in life, and, and what's sad is that's also true in prayer is we just don't take the time to engage God by even asking for the things that we want and need. Jesus just says, this is the first step. This is the easiest path. Ask. Ask. And the reason we don't, there's there's a whole host of reasons that we don't, but but whatever the case may be, he says, just ask. Ask and it, it will be given to you. And then we go from there to a little more intense. Seek. Seek is you have to actually go look out for it. And so when you pray for something, we certainly give it over to God. And yet we don't sit idly by and expect for, for us to not have to do anything. Yes, we, we, we ask God. But there's also this part of us that we need to be alert and we need to be active. And God has given us cognitive abilities for a reason. And we need to be on the lookout for things. And we need to be trying to solve problems. And that doesn't mean that we're taking things away from God. But it, also, but, but it doesn't mean either that we just pray about something then we don't work for anything or, or try to accomplish anything at that point either. So the first step is, is merely to ask. And then the second step is to seek. It's to go out there and to search and to look around. And then the step is to knock. You've asked. You've sought after it. And now it's time to face that answer. It's time to face that solution. It gets more intense as the list goes on. And Jesus says this, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus says here, there are going to be results when you pray. If you want to see results in your life, pray. That's what he says. And I shudder to think that if some of us are in a situation or a season or a circumstance in our life merely because we haven't prayed about it. We spend a lot of time complaining. We spend a lot of time feeling sorry for ourselves. But we haven't even started the process of prayer. When you pray, you are going to see results. God is going to move, and God is going to work. And I just shudder to think that if some of us, the result is right there. 
But we haven't experienced what we desperately want and we desperately need. Because we merely haven't asked for it. And so I don't want to just talk about that just today. But right now in the quietness of this room, in the circumstances of your heart, you know what's going on. And so we're just going to be quiet for about the next minute. And right where you're seated, right where you are, use this time as an opportunity just to cry out to God, to ask, and to start that process of what you're facing and what you're experiencing. Go ahead now. God, hear our prayers. Amen. And then Jesus wants to really get this point across. He wants to get this point home. He really wants to help us understand. And so he says this, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? Jesus is using this, this analogy just to highlight the goodness of God and the fact that we can approach God as a father who has a great relationship with his children. And he highlights here just the goodness and the loving nature of God. And he says, which of you, if, you, if, you, if your son asked for a fish, would instead, as a father, give him a serpent? See, understand what Jesus is saying. That God is loving, that He is good, that even Jesus hates snakes, so we all should as well. I mean, it's right there. It's right there. And some of you, you've got your little exotic pet collections, and you've got little Satans crawling around your house, and you just need to inventory your life, because you're not walking in the will of God when that's the case. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you. Even Jesus hates snakes. Jesus and I both, right? Because they're awful. So here's the deal. Jesus says, which of your sons asks you for fish, asks you for a fish, and you go and you give him a snake? No. Or which of them? Which of them asks for an egg? You give him a scorpion. Listen, some of you, you need to shake the guilt that was impounded in you from the time that you grew up, that God is angry at you and he's mad all the time. And if, you, if you've ever made a mistake in your life, that God is never again going to be on your side and you're just constantly confined, trying to live up to some standard that was, that was poured into your mind, either from, from parents or from people in church or whatever the case may be, and you've built up this, this complex idea that God will never be for you and you can never measure up to the standards of God. And I just want to let us all know we can't. We don't measure up to the standards of God. That's perfection. The good news for us is we can't, but Jesus did. And so in Jesus, we do measure up to the standards of God. And we have direct access to God as a result, as his children. And he is a good God and a God who loves us and wants to do for us what we desire. He loves you. And maybe that's just something that you really can't wrap your mind around, but just understand, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. And until you embrace that, prayer will never be all for you that it could be. You have a loving Father 
who wants to give you good gifts and the things that you desire and request. If you then who are evil, see, we can't measure up, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Jesus says, if you who don't measure up, if you who are far away from God, if you who, who, don't, have, who don't have the insight, obviously, that God has, and if you who, who fall so short, if you still understand this concept, that you still love your children and you still give them good gifts, how much more so will our perfect Father, our perfect Creator, our perfect God give us, His children, good things? And then notice where Jesus ends, because this, this seems kind of, kind of strange a little bit. But notice where Jesus ends. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is God's greatest gift. That at the moment we make the decision to follow Jesus, at the moment we make the decision to c confess our shortcomings, to ask for God to forgive us, to acknowledge the fact that we fall short of God's standard of perfection, but Jesus met the standard of perfection so that in Him we could become the righteousness of God, so that in the act of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins and raising again three days later, when God looks at us, he no longer sees our mistakes, he no longer sees our imperfections, he no longer sees the ways that I have purposely hurt other people, he no longer sees that, what he looks at when he sees me is the blood of Jesus covering all of my shortcomings and all of our, my mistakes and all of my sins, and so he sees me as his child, and I have a relationship with God, and at the moment I make the decision. To give my life to God. The Spirit of God comes and resides within me. Jesus was talking to his disciples and they said, don't leave us. And Jesus says, I have a greater gift that is coming for you. Do you understand this? Do you understand the ramifications of this? We would all love to have dinner with Jesus. Every single one of us, if we could have dinner with one person, we're like, Jesus? Here's the deal. If you've made the decision to give your life over to God, accept the gift that Jesus has done on our behalf, God resides within you. And you have direct access to him. This is the greatest gift that God would come and indwell us and work on our lives, mold our hearts, enable us to become more like Him. Not because there's some some set of rules or legalistic creed that God wants us all to abide by, but because he wants to work on us and make us more in his image, to restore the nature to that which we were originally created to be. It's the Spirit that petitions the Son on our behalf, that petitions the Father when we pray. It's the work of God within us. This is God's greatest gift. From a good God to us who fall short. But that God would come in, live within us, 
and enable us to become more like Him. To give us a new nature. So that in a world completely devoid of all these things, that love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control could be markers that define us in a culture that is completely devoid of them. And in the chaos that we see that develops as a result, our lives could be different. That's the promise of God. That's the work that God wants to do within us. And it's the Spirit that convicts and that moves us closer and closer in the process that we all undertake after we make the decision to follow Jesus and becoming more like God. And he's given to us. And he hears our prayers. And he answers them. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek. And you will find. Knock. And the door will be open. So I just want to leave you this morning with one question. And that's this. Are you asking? Are you seeking? And are you knocking? Are you asking? Are you seeking? And are you knocking? Because your good father's ready. And he loves you. And prayer will make a difference. Are you willing? God, help us ask. Help pride die. And help us ask. Help us seek. And give us the courage to knock. God, I, I pray for the person here that is just struggling with years of upbringing and expectations and guilt and all kinds of other things. And God, I just pray that you would release them today of trying to live up to a standard they will never meet. And resting in the fact that you love them anyways and your son met the standard that we cannot and they would find freedom in Jesus. I pray for the person, God, that is just jaded. And frankly, they don't really even want to be here right now. But in, in, in your providence, you have them here. And God, we just pray right now that you would penetrate their heart, and even God in their skepticism right now out of a place of desperation, they would just cry out to you just to give it a shot because nothing else has worked. God, I pray you'd hear that prayer. Pray for the person that's just tired, just ready to quit. So they keep praying. And they don't see any results. And they're just weary. And I pray in a very tangible and real way that you'd help them not give up. And you would once again reveal to them the goodness of your nature. Thank you for the gift of your spirit that comes and resides within us. And God, I pray that all of us here who've made the decision to follow you would be in tune with your spirit. That we would listen. And in the process, we would become more like you. For your glory. God, help us ask.
Help us seek and help us knock. In your son Jesus' name we pray.